أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا أهل الكتاب تعالوا إلى كلمة سواء بيننا وبينكم ألا نعبد إلا الله ولا نشك به شيئا ولا يتخذ بعضنا بعضا أربابا من دون الله فإن تولوا فقولوا شدوا بأننا مسلمون رب الشهل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني Yafqahu Qawli My respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May the peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God be upon all of you And this was the same greeting that was used by Jesus Christ peace be upon him It is mentioned in the Gospel of Luke Chapter number 24, verse number 36 in Hebrew, Shalom Alaikum. And in Arabic, it is Assalamu Alaikum. May peace be on all of you. The topic of my talk is similarities between Islam and Christianity. Islam comes from the root word Salam, which means peace. It is also derived from the Arabic word Silm, which means to submit your will to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thus, Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anyone who submits his will to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is called as a Muslim. Many people have a misconception that Islam is a new religion and it came into existence 1400 years ago and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he is the founder of this religion but in fact Islam is there since time immemorial since man set foot on this earth and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he is not the founder of this religion but he is the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Fatir chapter number 35 verse number 24 and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah Raad Chapter number 13, verse number 7. وَلِكُلِّ قَوْمٍ had And to each period, we have sent a revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Raad, chapter number 13, verse number 7. وَلِكُلِّ قَوْمٍ had And to each people, we have sent a messenger. By name, 25 messengers are mentioned in the glorious Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 24, wa illa khala fiha And there is not a nation to whom we have not sent a warner or a guide. So by name, 25 messengers are mentioned in the glorious Quran. For example, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith for its followers to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. So by name, 25 messengers are mentioned in the glorious Quran. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 164, and Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40, verse number 78, And messengers, some whose stories we have narrated to thee, and some whose stories we have not narrated to thee. 
So by name, 25 messengers are mentioned in the glorious Quran. But all the prophets, all the messengers that came before the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were only meant for their people and for that time. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 49. وَرَسُولًا إِلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ And a messenger to the children of Israel. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was only sent for the Bani Israel, only for the children of Israel. And a similar message is repeated in Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 6. That, O children of Israel, I am a messenger that has been sent to you, confirming the law that was sent before me and giving glad tiding of a messenger who will come after me, whose name will be Ahmad, which is another name of the Prophet wasallam. A similar message is mentioned in the Bible. It is mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 and 6. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Go ye not into the way of the Gentiles. Enter ye not into the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. A similar message is repeated in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse number 24. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, I have not been sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was only sent for the Bani Israel, only for the Jews, only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Since Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger, he was not sent only for the Muslims or only for the Arabs, but he was sent for the whole of humanity. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ahzab, chapter number 33, verse number 40, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِّنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِ الرَّسُولَ اللَّهُ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْنَ عَلِيمًا And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is not the father of any of you men, but he is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets. And Allah has full knowledge of all things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ الْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not, but as a mercy to all the worlds, as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to the whole of humanity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Saba, chapter number 34, verse number 28, min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Saba, chapter number 34, verse number 28, that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was sent as a universal messenger. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَّةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَذِيرًا That we have sent thee not, but as a universal messenger, giving glad tidings and warning people against sin. But most of them, they did not understand. So since Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was the last and final messenger. He was not sent only for the Muslims or only for the Arabs, but he was sent for the whole of humanity. And the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it is mentioned in scriptures of all the major world religions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah A'raf, chapter number 7, verse number 157, الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الرَّسُولَ النَّبِيَّ الْأُمِّيِّ الَّذِي يَجِدُونَهُ مَكْتُوبًا عِنْدَهُمْ فِي التَّورَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ Those who follow the unlettered prophet whom they would find mentioned in their scriptures in the law and in the gospel. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is prophesied in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18. It says, I will raise thee up a prophet from among thy brethren like unto thee and I shall put my words into his mouth and he shall speak all that I command. 
Now, many of the Christians, they say that this prophecy refers to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And when you ask them that how does this prophecy refer to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, so they say that the prophecy says, I will raise thee up a prophet from among thy brethren like unto thee. The prophet to come should be like prophet Moses, peace be upon him. And the similarities that they give between prophet Moses, peace be upon him, and prophet Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, are that both of them were Jews and both of them, they were prophets of God. If these two are the only similarity, if these two are the only similarities of fulfillment of prophecy, then there are several prophets that are mentioned in the Bible that fulfill the prophecies. For example, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, Joel, John the Baptist, all of them were Jews and all of them they were prophets of God. If these two are the only similarities of fulfillment of prophecies, then there are several prophets that are mentioned in the Bible that fulfill the prophecy. Therefore, this prophecy does not befit anyone but the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If we analyze Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, both of them, they were born naturally. They had a mother and they had a father. Whereas Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was born miraculously without any male intervention. He had a mother, but he did not have a father. And this is mentioned in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 47, and in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 1, verse number 35. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was like Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, and Prophet Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was unlike Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. Furthermore, if we analyze, Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, both of them, they got married and they had children. Whereas Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, according to the Bible, he did not get married, nor did he have children. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was like Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, and Prophet Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was unlike Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. Furthermore, if we analyze, Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, both of them, they died a natural death. Whereas Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it is mentioned, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 158, ilay, that Allah raised him up alive. Now many Christians may argue and say, no, 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 he was crucified. Irrespective whether he was crucified or he was raised up alive, he did not die a natural death. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was like Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, and Prophet Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was unlike Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. Furthermore, if we analyze, Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, both of them, they were accepted by the people as a whole. Whereas Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 1, verse number 11, that he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Furthermore, if we analyze, Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, both of them, they were worldly kings. They could give punishment of life and death. They had that power. Whereas Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it is mentioned in the Gospel of John, Chapter number 18, verse number 36. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, My kingdom is not of this world. Furthermore, if we analyze, Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, both of them, they bought a new law. Whereas Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it is mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Think not, I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have come not to destroy, but to fulfill. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was like Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, and Prophet Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was unlike Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. 
The next verse, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 19, it says that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, I will require it of him. Some translations say that I will take revenge. So whosoever does not follow the Prophet to come, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Almighty God will take revenge against those people. And it is mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12, the book is delivered to thee, saying, read this, pray thee. And he said, I am not learned. And this is exactly what our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said. When Archangel Gabriel, Jibreel alayhi salam, came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he told him, Iqra, read. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ma ana biqari, I am not learned. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He is prophesied in the Old Testament. It's mentioned in the Song of Solomon's, chapter number 5, verse number 16. Hikku Muhammad Takim, vi kullu Muhammadim, zehdudi wa zehrai, bayna Jerusalem. It is a Hebrew quotation which means, his mouth is most sweet, he's altogether lovely. This is my beloved, this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. In Semitic languages, im is added as respect. So to Muhammad, im is added. So it becomes Muhammadim. Now when you read the translation of the Bible, they have changed this word Muhammadim as altogether lovely. So when you read the translation of the Bible, you do not realize that the name of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is mentioned in the Bible. Time does not permit me to discuss all the prophecies. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 6, that, O children of Israel, I am a messenger sent to you confirming the law that was sent before me and giving glad tidings of a messenger to come after me whose name will be Ahmad, which is another name of the beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is prophesied even in the New Testament. It is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 16. And I will pray to the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. It is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 15, verse number 26. But when the comforter has come, whom I shall send him unto you, even the spirit of truth which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. Furthermore, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter shall not come. For if I depart, I shall send him unto you. Now many of the Christians, they say that this prophecy refers to the Holy Spirit. And when you ask them that how does this prophecy refer to the Holy Spirit, the prophecy clearly says in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go not away. For if I go not away, the comforter shall not come. For if I depart, I shall send him unto you. Now the criteria for the comforter to come is that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he should depart. Only after Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, will depart, the comforter can come. And we very well know the Holy Spirit, he was there before Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born. He was there when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born. He was there in the feast of Pentecost. So this prophecy cannot refer to the Holy Spirit. But it refers to no one but the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It is clearly mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself. All that he hears shall he speak. 
He shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me. Again, this prophecy refers to no one but the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Raad, chapter number 13, verse number 38, لِكُلِّ أَجَلٍ kitab. For each period, we have sent a book. By name, four revelations are mentioned in the glorious Qur'an. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the Qur'an. The Torah was the wahi, the revelation that was given to Moses, peace be upon him. The Zabur was the wahi, the revelation that was given to David, peace be upon him. The Injil was the wahi, the revelation that was given to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And the Quran is the last and final revelation that was given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So by name, four revelations are mentioned in the glorious Qur'an. But there were several other revelations. For example, Suhuf Ibrahim, the scrolls of Prophet Ibrahim, may peace be upon him. But by name, only four revelations are mentioned. But all the revelations that came before the last and final revelation, that is the glorious Qur'an, they were only meant for their people and for that time. It was time bound. But the glorious Qur'an is not meant only for the Muslims or only for the Arabs, but it is meant for the whole of humanity. And this is mentioned in several places in the glorious Qur'an. It is mentioned in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 1. Alif Lam Ra, kitabun anzalnahu ilayk, li tukhrija nasa min al-dhulumati ila nur. The book is revealed to thee in order to lead mankind from the depths of darkness into light. It is mentioned in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 52. Here is a message. Let them take warning thereof and let them know that there is one God. Let men of understanding take heed. It is mentioned in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185. شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان Ramadan is the month in which the glorious Qur'an was revealed as a guidance for the whole of humanity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 41, that the book is revealed to thee in truth for mankind. It does not say to instruct only the Muslims or only the Arabs, the glorious Quran was not meant only for the Muslims or only for the Arabs, but it is meant for the whole of humanity. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, book of Iman, hadith number seven, بني الإسلام على خمس شهادة أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله إقام الصلاة إتاء الزكاة حج البيت وصوم رمضان that Islam is based on five pillars the first is to testify لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله that there is only one God who is worthy of worship that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is his servant and his messenger. The second is to establish regular prayer that is salah. The third is to give zakah that is charity. The fourth is to fast in the month of Ramadan that is saum and the fifth is to perform pilgrimage that is hajj to the holy city of Makkah. The first is La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah to testify that there is only one God worthy of worship that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is his servant and his messenger. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 177 لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ قِبَلَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ وَلَكِنَّ الْبِرَّ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَالْمَلَائِكَةِ وَالْكِتَابِ وَالْنَبِيِّينَ It is not righteousness that you turn your faces towards the east or the west, but it is righteousness to believe in Allah and the last day and the angels and the books and the messengers. 
And I started my talk with the quotation from the glorious Quran from Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64. It says, Qul ya al-kitab. See, O people of the book. Ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'in bayna wa baynukum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'abud illa Allah. That we worship none but one almighty God. Wala nushika bihi shay'a. That we associate your partners with him. Wala yattakhiza ba'aduna ba'adhan arbaaban min duni Allah. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons of Allah. For in tawallahu, if then they turn back, for kulu shadu, say ye bear witness, be anna muslimun, that we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse of the glorious Quran, according to me, it is the master key for doing dawah. It shows us how to talk to different types of people people of different religions what does it say ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'in banina wa bainakum come to common terms as between us and you which is the first term allah na'bud illa allah that we worship none but one almighty god allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah ikhlas chapter number 112 verse number 1 to 4 Qul huwallahu ahad. Say he is Allah, the one and only. Allah samad. Allah, the absolute, the eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakullahu kufwan ahad. And there is nothing like unto him. This surah ikhlas is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given in the glorious Quran. It is the touchstone of theology. Theo in Greek means Lord and Logi means study. Thus theology means study of God. And if anyone says that so and so candidate is Almighty God and if that candidate fits in this four line definition, we Muslims, we have got no objection in accepting that candidate as God. We Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as God if he fits in this four-line definition of Surah Ikhlas. And a similar message is mentioned in the Bible. It's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, verse number 4. Shama Israelo Adonai la hainu Moses, peace be upon him, said, Yer, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. A similar message is repeated in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29. Shama Israelo, Adonai la hainu Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Shama Israelo, Adonai la hainu ad Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 48, Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bih wa yaghfiru ma duna thalika liman yasha wa man yushrik billah faqad iftara ithman azima that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he may forgive any sin if he pleases except for the sin of shirk for the one who associates partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has committed a sin most heinous indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 116, Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bih, wa yaghfiru ma duna thalika liman yasha, wa man yushrik billah, faqad dhalla dhalalan ba'idah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He may forgive any sin if He pleases except for shirk. For anyone who associates partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has strayed far, far away from the right. So shirk is the biggest sin in Islam. And a similar message mentioned in the Bible. It's mentioned in the book of Exodus, chapter number 20, verse number 3 to 5. Almighty God says, Thou shalt have no other God besides me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of any likeness of anything in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, in the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, thy Lord, Thy God is a jealous God. 
A similar message is repeated in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, verse number 7 to 9. Thou shall have no other God besides me. Thou shall not make unto thee any graven image of any likeness of anything in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, in the water beneath the earth. Thou shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, thy Lord, thy God, is a jealous God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 72, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهُ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرْيَمُ That they do blaspheme, they do kufr those who say, Allah is Christ, the Son of God. وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحُ And said Christ, يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلُ O children of Israel, أُعْبُدُ اللَّهُ Worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum, who is my Lord and your Lord. إِنَّهُ مَا يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهُ for whosoever shall associate partners with Allah. فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ Then Allah will make Jannat haram for him. وَمَأْوَاهُ النَّارِ And the fire is his dwelling place. وَمَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِنْ أَنصَارِ And for the wrongdoers, there is no one to help. So the biggest sin in Islam, as well as in Christianity, is shirk. That is associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there are many Christians who say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. He said that he was almighty God. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement, not a single unambiguous statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says, I am God, or where he says, worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, it is mentioned, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, my father is greater than I, Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all, Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devil with the Spirit of God, Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I with the finger of God, cast out devil, Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says, I seek not my will, but the will of my Father, he's a Muslim. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was a Muslim. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never claimed divinity. In fact, if you read, it is mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. Ye men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man of the God amongst you, by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by himself in the name of the Spirit, a man of the God amongst you, by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by himself and you are witness to it. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never claimed divinity. He was one of the mightiest messengers of God. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110. قُلِذُ اللَّهُ أَبِدُ الرَّحْمَانِ أَيَّمْ مَا تَدْعُوا فَلَهُ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَةِ Say, call upon him by Allah or call him by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belong the most beautiful names. And there are no less than 99 different names given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Hakim, Most Gracious, Most Merciful, Most Wise. But the crowning one is Allah. And this is also mentioned in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 8. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 180. As well as in Surah Hashra, chapter number 59, verse number 24. That to Allah belong the most beautiful names. Now why do we Muslims prefer calling Allah with the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. Because a person can play mischief with the English word God. For example, if we add S to God, so it becomes gods, that is the plural of God, there is nothing like the plural of Allah. Qul hu Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah, the one and only. If we add D-E-S-S to God, so it becomes goddess, that is a female God, there is nothing like male Allah or female Allah in Islam. 
If we add father to God, so it becomes Godfather, he's my Godfather, he's my guardian. There is nothing like Allah Father or Allah by Islam. If we add mother to God, so it becomes Godmother. There is nothing like Allah Mother or Allah in Islam. If we prefix tin to God, so it becomes tin God, that is a fake God. There is nothing like tin Allah or fake Allah in Islam. That's the reason we Muslims prefer calling Allah with the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. And this word Allah is mentioned in the scriptures of all the major world religions. In fact, if you read, it's mentioned in the Bible, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 15, verse number 34, as well as in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 27, verse number 46, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, when he was put on the cross, when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was put on the cross, he cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. O oh God, O oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? And if you open any version of the Bible, whether it be the Revised Standard Version, whether it be the New International Version, whether it be the King James Version, any version of the Bible you open, this phrase, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabakhtani, has been maintained. If you read any translation of the Bible, whether it be the Hindi Bible, the Arabic Bible, the German Bible, the English Bible, this phrase, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabakhtani, has been maintained. And why it has been maintained is known best by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, this word Allah is mentioned in scriptures of all the major world religions. And this phrase, Allah, Allah, Lama Sabakhtani, in English, it is, O oh God, O oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? Does it sound similar? Does Allah, Allah, Lama Sabakhtani sound similar to, O oh God, O oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? Or, Yehovah, Yehovah, why hast thou forsaken me? And the answer is no. Allah, Allah, Lama Sabakhtani, in Allah, it is Allah, in Arabic, it is Allah, Allah, Lama Taraktani. It is similar because Hebrew and Arabic, they are Semitic languages. The second pillar of Islam is Salah. And many people translate Salah as prayer. To pray means to besiege, to ask for help. And in Salah, Besides asking help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we praise Him, we glorify Him, we ask gaining guidance from Him. Therefore, prayer is not the appropriate translation of the Arabic word salah. I prefer calling salah as a sort of programming towards righteousness. For example, if the Imam after Surah Fatiha, he recites Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu O oh, you who believe Innama al-khamru wal-maysiru Wal-ansabu wal-azlam Ritsum min amal al-shaytan Fajtanibuhu la'allakum tuflihoon O oh, you who believe Most certainly Intoxicants and gambling Dedication of stones Divination of arrows Are an abomination From Satan's handiwork Eschew Abstain from such abomination That ye may prosper So in Salah, you are being programmed towards righteousness. That alcohol has been prohibited. Gambling has been prohibited. You need to stay away from alcohol. You need to stay away from gambling. For example, if the Imam after Surah Fatiha, he recites Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 45. Recite from the book what is revealed to thee. And establish prayer, for prayer restrains from shameful and unjust deeds. So here we are being programmed towards righteousness. Therefore, Salah is a sort of programming towards righteousness. Or in layman's terminology, you can call it as brainwashing. But if someone asks you that where are you going, and if you tell them I am going for brainwashing, it may sound a bit odd. Therefore, I do not have any objection if anyone uses the English word prayer for the Arabic word Salah. But I would like to remind them 
that it is not the appropriate translation. And we Muslims, we have to offer salah five times a day. And this is mentioned in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 78, and Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 130, that we have to offer salah five times a day. Like how for a healthy body, you require three meals a day. Similarly, for a spiritual soul, you have to offer salah five times a day. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number six, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا قُمْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَغْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ إِلَى الْمَرَافِقِ O oh, you who believe, when you stand for prayer, wash your face and your hands up till your elbows. Rub your head and wash your feet up till your ankles. So wudu is compulsory before offering salah. Before offering salah, wudu, wudu is compulsory. And this is also mentioned in the Bible. It is mentioned in the book of Exodus, chapter number 40, verse number 31 and 32. Moses and Aaron washed their hands and feet thereat. And when they came into the tent of congregation, and when they came close to the altar, they washed as the Lord had commanded Moses, peace be upon him. And a similar message is mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 21, verse number 26. Paul, along with his men, washed in front of the Lord. So wudu is compulsory in Islam as well as in Christianity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 11 and 12. فَلَمَّا أَتَاهَا نُودِيَا مُوسَى إِنِّي أَنَا رَبُّكْ فَخْلَعْنَا عَلَيْكَ إِنَّكَ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ طُوَى And when Moses approached the sacred valley of Tuwa, he heard a voice, O oh Moses, indeed I am your Lord. So take off thy shoes of thy feet, for the place thou standest is the sacred valley of Tuwa. And a similar message mentioned in the Bible. It is mentioned in the book of Exodus, chapter number 3, verse number 5. Draw knee hither, take off thy shoes of thy feet, for the place thou standest is holy ground. And it is mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 7, verse number 33. Put off thy shoes of thy feet, for the place thou standest is holy ground. So according to the Quran and according to the Bible, it was the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Moses, peace be upon him, to take off his footwear. And it is mentioned in Sunnah Abu Dawood, Volume 1, Book of Salah, Chapter number 240, Hadith number 653, Amr bin Shu'aib, on the authority of his father, on the authority of his father, that his grandfather said that he had seen the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam offering with footwear as well as without footwear. So we can offer with our footwear as well as without our footwear. But when we offer with our footwear, we have to see to it that we clean the souls. And it is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, book of Adhan, chapter number 75, hadith number 692, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he used to stand, his feet you should touch the feet of the companion. His shoulder, you should touch the shoulder of the companions. And it is mentioned in Abu Dawood, Volume 1, Book of Salah, Chapter number 245, Hadith number 666, that Abdullah ibn Umar, he says that the Prophet وسلم, before offering Salah, he turned around and he said, straighten your rows, stand feet to feet, stand shoulder to shoulder, closing up the gaps, and do not leave any opening for the devil. The Prophet was not referring to the devil, which you see in the Onida TV ad with two horns and a tail, but he was referring to the devil of caste, of racism, of color, irrespective whether you're rich or poor, whether you're black or white, when you stand for Salah, you have to stand feet to feet and shoulder to shoulder. And the best part of Salah it is the sujood. 
and sujood and its derivatives are mentioned in the glorious Quran no less than 92 times. It's mentioned in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 43. Ya Maria Mokunuti li Rabbiki was judi warkaim ar rakain. O Mary, prostrate and bow down with those who bow down. It is mentioned in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 77. Ya ayyuhalladina amanur ka'u was judu wa abudu rabbakum wa fa'alul khayra la'allakum tuflihun. O you who believe, prostrate, bow down, adore your Lord, and do good that you may prosper. And all the prophets of Almighty God, when they prayed Salah, they did sujood. And this is also mentioned in the Bible. It is mentioned in the book of Genesis, chapter number 17, verse number 3. Abraham fell on his face and he prayed to the Lord. It is mentioned in the book of Numbers, chapter number 20, verse number 6. Moses and Aaron, they fell on their faces and the glory of the Lord appeared upon them. It is mentioned in the book of Joshua, chapter number 5, verse number 14. Joshua fell on his face and he prayed to the Lord. In the New Testament, it is mentioned the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 26, verse number 39. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he takes a few steps further and he fell on his face. So all the prophets of Almighty God, they did sujood, that is prostration. And no gymnast also can do better than the way we Muslims do it, putting the highest point of the body, that is the forehead, to the lowest point of the ground, and saying, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, glory be to him who is the most high. And the psychologists, they tell us that our mind is not directly under our control. So in order to humble our mind, we have to humble our body. And there is no better way than putting the highest point of the body, that is the forehead, to the lowest point of the ground and saying, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, glory be to him who is the most high three times. The third pillar of Islam is zakah, that is charity. Every rich person who has a saving of more than the Saab level, of more than 85 grams of gold, he should give 2.5% of a saving every lunar year in charity. If every rich man gives charity, poverty will eradicate from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. And it is mentioned in the glorious Quran in Surah Hashr, chapter number 59, verse number 7, that zakah has been prescribed so that it prevents the wealth from circulating only amongst the rich. And it is mentioned in the Bible, in the first Peter, chapter number 4, verse number 8, that give fervent charity, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. The fourth pillar of Islam is the psalm, that is fasting. Every adult Muslim who is healthy, he should fast. That is abstain from food, drink and sex from dawn to sunset for one full lunar month. That is the month of Ramadan. And it is mentioned in the glorious Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 183. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum usriyam kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed as it was prescribed to those before you so that you may attain self-restraint, so that you may attain self-control. So fasting has been prescribed and the purpose of fasting, it is for self-restraint, it is for self-control. And the psychologists, they tell us that if you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desires. And there are various med benefits of fasting, medical benefits, other benefits. You can give a talk only on the benefits of fasting. And today medical science tells us that if you fast according to Islam for one full lunar month, then it increases intestinal absorption. It reduces cholesterol level. If a person can abstain from smoking 
from dawn to sunset, he can very well abstain from smoking from the cradle to the grave. If a person can abstain from having alcohol from dawn to sunset, he can very well abstain from having alcohol from the cradle to the grave. It inculcates in ourselves the habits that are good. And fasting is also prescribed in the Bible. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 9, verse number 29. The fifth pillar of Islam is the Hajj. That is pilgrimage to the holy city of Makkah. About three to four million people from different parts of the world, they come to the holy city of Makkah. And the men, they are dressed in two pieces of cloth, preferably white. You cannot identify the person standing beside you, whether he's a king or a pauper. It is the best example of international brotherhood. People from different parts of the world come, from India, from Pakistan, from Qatar, from America, and they are dressed in two pieces of unsewn cloth, preferably white. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Hujurat, Chapter number 49, verse number 13. Ya ayyuhan nas, inna khalaqnaakum min dhakarin wa untha, wa ja'alnaakum shu'uban wa qabaila li ta'arafu, inna akramakum inda Allahi atqaakum, inna Allahi alimun khabir. O mankind, we have created you from a single pair of a male and female, and divided you into nations and tribes, so that you may recognize each other. Not that you may despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. And Allah is all-knowing, well acquainted. The criterion for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not caste, it's not color, it's not wealth, it's not sex, but it is righteousness. It is God consciousness. It is taqwa. It is piety. And it is mentioned in the Bible, in the book of in the book of Psalms, chapter number 84, verse number 4 to 7, that blessed are the people who travel to the valley of Bakka. It's mentioned in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 96. Inna awwala baytin wudi al nas, lalladhi bi bakkata mubarak. That the first house that was appointed for men was Bakka. And Bakka is another name of Makkah. So this was in brief regarding the five pillars of Islam. This is not the complete structure. These are only the pillars. But if the pillars are strong, inshallah, God willing, even the structure will be strong. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Dhariyat, Chapter number 51, verse number 56. That I have not created jinn and mankind except to worship me. The word ibadah is derived from the root word abd, which means to serve. So if you obey the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, innam al-khamru wal-maysiru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal-ansab wal-azlam, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, ritsum bin amal al-shaytan, are an abomination from Satan's handiwork. Abstain from such abomination that ye may prosper. Here we are being programmed towards righteousness. That alcohol is prohibited, gambling is prohibited, fortune telling is prohibited. And alcohol has been prohibited even in the Bible. It is mentioned in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 20, verse number 1. That wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. It is mentioned in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5, verse number 18. And be not drunk with wine. So if Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, I would like to say that we Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in no less than four different places in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 173, in Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 3, in Surah Anam chapter number 6 verse number 145, as well as in Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse number 115, Hurrimat alaykum al maytatu waddamu wa lahmul khinzeen. Forbidden for you food are dead meat, blood, flesh of swine, and any food on which any other name besides Allah's name has been taken. So these four types of food, they are prohibited for us Muslims. And these types of food, they are even prohibited in the Bible. Dead meat is prohibited in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 17, verse number 15, and in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 21. That ye shall not eat that which dieth of itself. So dead meat is prohibited even in the Bible. And regarding blood, it is prohibited in the Bible in several places. It is mentioned in the book of Genesis, chapter number 9, verse number 4. It is mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 15, verse number 29, as well as in the first Samuel, chapter number 14, verse number 33. Blood has been prohibited in the Bible. Regarding pork, it is prohibited in the Bible. It is mentioned in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 7 and 8. That the swine, though it divided the hoof, and it is cloven footed. It is cloven footed, yet chewed not the cud. Thou shalt not eat their flesh, nor shalt thou touch their dead carcass. They are unclean for you. A similar message is repeated in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 8. That the swine, though it is divided the hoof, yet chewed not the cud. Thou shalt not eat their flesh. It is unclean for you, nor shalt thou touch their dead carcass. And pork is also prohibited in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 65, verse number 2 to 5. Regarding eating food on the name other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is prohibited in the Bible. It is mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 15, verse number 29, and the book of Revelation, chapter number 2, verse number 14. That you cannot eat food, those food on which names other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name has been taken. So if Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, I would like to say that we Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Ma'un, chapter 107, verse number 1 to 7, Woe to the one who denies the day of judgment. And for the one who denies feeling the indigent. Woe to those who pray. pray. Woe to those who pray and those who are neglectful in their prayers. Woe to those who pray to be seen of men and they do not even provide neighborly assistance. So if you provide neighborly assistance, if you help your neighbors, you are obeying the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Humaza, chapter number 104, verse number 1, وَيْلُلِّ كُلِّ هُمَزَةِ الْلُمَزَةِ Woe to every kind of scandal monger and backbiter. So scandal mongering is prohibited in Islam. Backbiting is prohibited in Islam. So if you abstain from backbiting, if you abstain from scandal mongering, you are submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 23 and 24, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُ إِلَّا إِيَّهِ in the الْكِبَرَ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفِّ وَلَا تَنْحَرْهُمَا وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا وَاحْفِظْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ وَقُلْ رَبِّ رَحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرًا And the Lord has decreed that you worship none but Him and to be kind to your parents, whether one or both of them attain old age. Say not a word of content, nor repel them, but address them in terms of honor and lower to them the wings of humility and say, My Lord, have mercy on them, 
even as they cherish me in childhood. So if you are kind to your parents, if you respect your parents, you are obeying the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> Monasticism, living a life of celibacy is prohibited in Islam. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7, book of Nikah, chapter number 3, hadith number 5066. Ya ma'ashar al-shabaab, man istata'a minkum ul-ba'ata fal yatazawwaj. O young people, whosoever amongst you is able to marry, he should marry. And in another hadith it is mentioned, فَمَنْ رَغِبَ أَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي That whosoever leaves my sunnah is not of me. So if you marry, you are obeying the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Nisa chapter number 4, verse number 19, وَعَاشِرُوهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ فَإِنْ كَرِهْتُمُوهُنَّ فَعَسَىٰ أَنْ تَكْرَهُوا شَيْئًا وَيَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ فِي خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا And treat your woman with a footing of kindness and equity. Even if you dislike her, you may dislike a thing, but Allah may bring a good deal out of it. So even if you dislike your wife, you have to treat her with a footing of kindness and equity. You have to treat her with kindness. And if you do so, you are submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are obeying the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 32. وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الزِّنَا And do not come close to adultery, for it is an opening towards evil. So if you abstain from adultery, you are submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are obeying the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Furthermore, regarding hijab, many people talk about hijab for the woman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran first talks about hijab for the man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, Kullil mu'minina yaghuddu min abusarihim wa yahfadu furujahum. Say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever any man looks at any woman, if any brazing thought, if any unashamed thought comes to his mind, he should lower his gaze. And this is also mentioned in the Bible. It is mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 27 and 28. That it was said to the people of the old times that thou shall not commit adultery. For I say unto you, for any man look at that any woman in order to feast on her beauty, he hath committed adultery in his heart. The next verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Nur chapter number 24, verse number 31. Say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty and display not her beauty except what is ordinary thereof and tell her to draw her veil over her bosoms and display not her beauty except in front of their husbands, their fathers, their sons and there's a big list of mehrams of close relatives who you cannot marry. There are basically six criteria for hijab that are mentioned in the glorious Quran and authentic ahadith. The first is the extent for the man and for the woman. For the man, it is from the navel to the knee. And for the woman, it is a complete body should be covered. The only parts that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. The remaining five criteria are same for the man and for the woman. The second, the clothes they wear, it should be loose. It should not be tight-fitting. It should not reveal the figure. The third, it should not be translucent or transparent. The fourth, that it should not be so glamorous that it attracts the opposite sex. The fifth, it should not be that of the opposite sex. And the sixth is that it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. These are basically six criteria for hijab. And it is mentioned in the Bible in the Old Testament. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 22, verse number 5, that the woman shall not wear that which pertains of the man, nor shall the man wear that 
which pertaineth of the woman. For anyone who does so is an abomination from the Lord thy God. And it's mentioned in the first Timothy chapter number two, verse number nine, that women should be dressed with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or costly array. It's mentioned in the first Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number five and six, that the woman who prayed with her head uncovered, she has dishonored her head. Her head should be shaved off. Imagine the Bible is more strict than the Quran and the Bible says Imagine the Bible is more strict than the Quran wherein the Bible says that the woman her head should be shaved off Circumcision Circumcision is a sunnah in Islam and it is even mentioned in the Bible it is mentioned in the book of Acts chapter number 7 verse number, verse number 8. It is also mentioned in the gospel of Luke chapter number 2 verse number 21 that Jesus Christ peace be upon him he was circumcised on the 8th day. So circumcision is also, is also mentioned in the Bible that you have to be circumcised. And Jesus Christ peace be upon him said it is mentioned in the gospel of John chapter number 5 verse number 30 I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my father. Anyone who says I seek not my will, but the will of my father, he's a Muslim. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was a Muslim. I would like to end my talk with the quotation from Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 82. وَلَا تَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارَى Nearest among them in faith will thou find who say we are Christians. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ